Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. This is the Microsoft 365 Platform Community Call for March 29th of 2022. I am Brian T. Jacket, your host for today. On our agenda today, we've got some great topics that we'll be covering, but first we'll go through our usual news updates, other things going on in the Microsoft 365 platform. We'll do our usual group time together mode, uh, and then we'll move into our demos. We've got Sean coming in to talk a little bit about SharePoint syntax, being able to work with some templates for this. Patrick Rogers will be joining us to talk a little bit more about ACE, um, be working with Viva Connections and our ACE components. And then Seb will be joining us for another overview of some various things we can do with Microsoft Graph Toolkit um, and our sample gallery for this. Now, for those of you who are new or those who've been around for a while, we've got a number of different resources and available uh, things for you to take a look at. Uh, whether this is going to be videos for yourself, we've got two different tracks for this. There are our developer videos as well as our community videos. You can find all the developer videos at aka.ms slash m365 YouTube. For all of our community calls, as well as a number of other different resources, you can find recordings and other things available on our community videos at aka.ms slash m365 slash videos. We have a number of different open source initiatives from PMP, from Office Devs, from SharePoint, from Graph, and so forth. A lot of great ways to be, get plugged in, be able to contribute back for docs, for samples, and for other things. Feel free to take a look at the links on the page for this. And as well for samples. Now, it's great to hear about things and see them as demos on here. If you actually want to kick the tires and actually test them out in your own environments, great ways to take a look at our samples galleries. We've got a lot of different areas for Teams, for SharePoint Framework, for Power Platform, and more. Um, but for our one-stop shop for everything, you can always go to aka.ms slash m365pmp, find all the links for the invites for the other different sample galleries and other initiatives. Please take a look there for finding all the one-stop shop information you need. And speaking of which, if you do not yet already have a way to actually test things out in your own sandbox environment, we do make available the M365 developer program. With this, you can get a free E5 developer tenant. It's valid for 90 days. As long as you continue to use that though, that will auto renew. So a great way to be able to get your hands on and play around with the different samples, be able to test things out, essentially have tenant admin mode directly on your own uh, sandbox environment. You can find more about this at aka.ms slash M365 slash dev program. Great way to go and get that uh, sandbox environment instantly available. But if you are looking for some learning material on uh, the various parts of M365, we've got a lot of great different training modules, different um, learning paths and more. Um, these are all provided to you free of charge. So no need to actually go and pay for uh, some of these areas. Instead, you can actually go and get some very great curated content built by a number of our folks at Microsoft and in our community. You can find more at aka.ms slash m365 slash dev slash learn. Great content out there and we're adding more as we go along. So please take a look at that. And in terms of our sample galleries, we continue to increase the number of samples out there. So we really, really appreciate everyone from joining into the community to share more about this. We're now over 1,040 samples. So we crossed the big 1,000 number and we're continuing to climb up. Love that everyone's joining into this and sharing more about this. You can find more about our samples at aka.ms slash m365 slash samples. Feel free to take a look and filter for the areas that you're most interested in and as well be able to contribute back uh, if you have any additional uh, samples you'd like to do on your own. And for those folks who want to get plugged into the different community efforts that we've got going on, we've got a lot of great things with our sharing as caring initiative. So Dave, we'll turn things over to you. Awesome. Thank you, Brian. Friends, as you may or may not know, Sharing is Caring is a program that is here to provide you hands-on guidance on getting more involved in the community. That could be starting to build your workstation for SPFX, starting to understand the landscape for being a presenter on one of our community calls. Uh, it could be how to use the samples, but most importantly, we'd love you to contribute back to those samples, and that's usually where some of the hurdles occur most often. But we are going to guide you through those hands-on in live safe space sessions where we're going to show you exactly the steps to take and we'll do it along together as a team. These are not recorded, so they're excellent opportunities to ask any and all questions. Uh, we are getting a lot, as you've heard me say, a lot of schedules set up. There's a lot of new conferences going on in the next couple of weeks, M365, conference in Vegas, the European Power Platform Conference. So we want to be sensitive of everyone's schedule and not overwhelm everyone. So uh, continue to look for those to be scheduled as we get into April and May. Uh, but we are working on the date of our Viva Connections. Ask me anything. These are excellent opportunities to get uh, the opportunity to ask questions from those directly on the programs. This will include John and Luca and Pat around Viva Connections, extensibility for uh, adaptive card extensions and all of those opportunities. So safe space, absolutely free. Don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions, aka.ms forward slash sharing is caring. Brian, back to you. Thank you so much, David. And we've got some other different podcasts and other videos that you can also join into to get the latest and greatest on uh, the things going on inside the Entrix 5 platform. First is our Microsoft 365 Developer Podcast with our very own Jeremy Thake from Microsoft, as well as Paul Shapeline from Edin 365. 
They do a number of different interviews, latest news, and other announcements coming to the Microsoft 365 platform. Feel free to take a look at this. You can find more at M365 Dev Podcast uh, to learn more about this. And we also have our Microsoft 365 PMP Weekly, where Vesa and Waldeck like to do interviews, to share announcements, and other things from coming from the community. Great way to see what's going on, as well as hear from people who are industry experts and people inside of Microsoft. You can find the video at aka.ms slash PMP Weekly and the podcast at pmpweekly.podbean.com. Now, out on our blogs, we do have a number of different areas where you can find more information for this. Again, we don't have a one-stop shop just yet for all of our blog posts, um, but you can find the three primary ones on here. Got our links on the upper right-hand corner. First, a couple of different news and things going on in the uh, various ecosystems. From the M365 developer platform, we do have a new set of Microsoft Graph APIs that are available for working with content types inside of SharePoint. So there is a new mechanism basically to do a pull as needed sync model rather than a push everywhere. You may have noticed that that kind of push everywhere model, sometimes it was slow or it was inconsistent in terms of actually getting that content out there. Now there's some new ways for actually to be able to work with us in a little bit more streamlined, a little bit more efficient manner. Please take a look at the new APIs available out there as well as some of the new guidance for this. We also have a couple of different posts coming from the Teams folks. Uh, we recently just celebrated our five-year anniversary with Microsoft Teams. So big milestone, lots of great engagement, lots of great developers building things on Teams. Um, this is a great post that actually recaps a lot of the various improvements that are going on. Um, most of them announced at the Enterprise Connect uh, conference that happened, I believe that was last week. Um, so a lot of different areas in terms of Teams rooms and per in terms of being able to RSVP to meetings using like the hybrid options, who's going to be in the room versus who's attending online, um, and many, many more announcements. So a great way to actually recap what's been going on in the ecosystem for a long time now. Um, please take a look at that post to find more information for that. We also have two other posts on here. Um, one is with the Inside Microsoft Teams um, uh, series. Uh, they originally did an interview with Atlassian, uh, the makers of Jira. Uh, this is on their episode one. They've actually revisited that because they got a lot of questions, a lot of comments from folks to actually dive a little bit deeper into this. So take a look at the latest episode for this, find out more about what Atlassian is doing to build into their integrations. And then lastly on here is um, some tips and tricks for being able to work with various things inside of uh, hybrid meetings. Uh, there's some ways we can think about using Power Automate, some other tools to actually help with tracking tasks, to be able to improve your workflow and other kind of things for that collaboration. So a lot of great uh, little things um, for uh, kind of seeing what's available with this and some recommendations for how you can actually work with your workflow better. And with this, I'll turn things over to Wajid to talk a little bit about some of our Teams platform docs updates. Thank you, Brian. I will walk you through the Teams platform, the documentation updates. Let's start with the platform updates on the left side. We have a new sample that is Microsoft Teams document signing. This is a proof of concept demonstrates sharing a document on a meeting stage view with the live signing feature. As an end user, you can create a bunch of documents to be signed and specify a name of person who is going to sign the document. These documents then can be shared in a meeting stage to get the signature. You can find this sample in Microsoft Teams sample repo at ak.ms slash team samples under meeting hyphen share to stage signing folder. In terms of features, the sample uses Teams SSO for tabs. It shows the programmatic ways of sharing content to the stage view. This also displays a specific view based on the logged in user. Please feel free to try it out. Now, let's move to the documentation part on the right. Step-by-step -step guide is an artifact that has a task-oriented approach, linear topic, provides an end-to-end -end scenario, and loops you back to the documentation. So we'll be talking about about two step-by-step -step guides today. The first one is build your first app using Blazor. So Blazor lets you build interactive web UI using C Sharp instead of JavaScript. Currently, Teams Toolkit for Widget Studio offers templates for only tab app with the Blazor. Second one is unfold links in Teams using Bot. Link unfolding using Bot in Teams help you register your app and receives an invoke activity with the URL with a particular domain when it's pasted into the Compose message area. The invoke contains the full URL and you can respond to it with a card. Users can unfurl the link using bot with additional information to get an enhanced experience. This step-by-step -step guide helps you create a bot to perform the link unfurling in Microsoft Teams. So these were the updates on the platform site. If you have any feedback or suggestion, please feel free to post it on aka.ms slash teams platform feedback. The link is available in the footer. 
You could also follow us on Twitter and configure the RSS feed to get the regular platform updates. Thank you. Back to you, Brian. Thank you so much, Wajid. Next, we've got an update from our Learn from the Community initiative. Um, this is a lot of our cloud developer advocates going out and actually interviewing folks from the community who are building great and awesome uh, different integrations. Uh, this week, we got an update from um, Bob German, who was actually talking with uh, Ravi Abhishek and Hitesh uh, from Decision Point, and they built some dashboards and some Teams chat integrations, uh, a great way to be able to see kind of what are people building, how are they doing this. So if you have your own stories that you'd like to share, or if you'd like to learn more about this, you can follow the links at the bottom on here. We've got aka.ms slash learn from the community slash this week. Um, or if you want to be able to share your own story, you can go to aka.ms slash share hyphen your hyphen story. Great way to see what people are actually building out there, see some inspiration, uh, and be able to get plugged in with that. And on a similar note, we do want to call out that we have an upcoming tech day. This is going to be on May 5th of 2022. So within just about a month and a, and a couple of weeks on here, um, a great way for us to be able to kind of see what's going on with the developer platform, find out a different information that's going to be available in the community. Uh, you can find more about this at aka.ms slash techdays slash M365. Um, please feel free to uh, sign up for this. Make sure you get all the announcements uh, and see when the schedules are going to be publishing for this. So great uh, community initiative that's going to be coming forth again. This is on May the 5th of 2022. And yes, as someone pointed out, that it will be Cinco de Mayo. So another great way for us to celebrate as a community. At this point, let's flip over to our picture time. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. If you guys would start to like to put your camera on. Oh my gosh, Seb, you are all decked out in your... <laughs> In your wonderful giraffe costume, let me switch over to gallery view. Uh, let me flip and share the screen, and then I will. I'm bit moving between the the calls, so this is a pretty busy day apparently today. We still have few row, rows available. 200 people in a call. We can max out in 50. Uh, yay! A few more. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. We're not filled in. A few more, a few more, a few more. I will start the recording uh, and then we'll capture the hand waving in a second. Uh, Seb's giraffe is pretty cool. So let's do some hand waving, everybody. We're going to grab a GIF animation out of this one. Thank you for joining the call. Really awesome to have you here. <laughs> really cool. <laughs> Thank you, Seb, for being the example on the back row. <laughs> really, really great again. This is, these are so good and so powerful also for uh, getting shared after the call as well. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Let's get back on the slides and the real stars of the day. Thank you so much. And Seb, I love that we got the high five in uh, together mode there. That was the highlight of my morning. We should really try to do the waves, you know, like in, in some time. Yeah, everyone if we... go back and forth and we'll do it in, uh, in synchronous. <laughs> in synchronous on the, yeah, that would be really interesting. That will be very, very tough, especially with the, the slight amount of lag that we sometimes get. Exactly. All right. Present in Teams. And I love that we have. Uh, crossed over the 200 mark yet again today. So thank you so much for everyone for joining in. It's great to see people tuning in despite uh, some of the other things that are going on this week. All right, let's move over into our demo section. We've got three great demos today. First, we'll be kicking off with Sean Squires. Talk a little bit about SharePoint syntax testing. Um, we'll turn things over to you, Sean. Floor is yours. Thanks, Brian. Good morning, everyone. Wow, it's been a while since I've joined you guys. I think uh, uh, Vesa has been telling me, hey, man, you got to come by and chat with people about what's been going on with Syntax. And uh, we've been working on a lot of things for Syntax, but one of the things that I wanted to share with you today is just some new templates that we have recently published to the Lookbook service to make it uh, easier to learn more about Syntax because we're still trying to help people understand what Syntax is and how you can benefit from it and, uh, with your content services needs. So let me quickly put some framing up here before we jump into the demo. Just a quick kind of framing of uh, great, Sean, Syntax, what is that? So Syntax is actually a new product add-on for SharePoint that we released back in October, 2020. And we have uh, since been continuing to evolve the service that was initially launched uh, that fall. Uh, as well as expanding uh, on the capability offering. And really what it is, is it's about really augmenting the already powerful SharePoint content services platform. And largely the way that we're doing that is with the introduction of just more automation uh, with the inclusion of uh, AI services and apps that you can easily configure or train to add to your uh, 
content that you're storing in SharePoint to automate classifying files, uh, stamping things with IP labels, extracting information from the documents, leveraging all those amazing investments you're making in taxonomy, content types, and other existing uh, SharePoint content management services. And so really what uh, we've been doing is uh, over the last year since the release of that is uh, continuing to build on this platform. And let me quickly jump over here to slides now. Um, and so one of the things that we've learned from uh, our preview customers and talking to MVPs and customers uh, like yourselves is just really learning that, hey, there's a lot here. How do we kind of try it out? How do we understand what syntax can work for me? And better and more importantly, how can I evaluate, best evaluate syntax to see if it's right for uh, my organization or my customer or my content needs? And so one of the things we do provide is a syntax uh, trial because it is an additional license on top of SharePoint. And what we and that license is great, but folks were like, hey, I didn't get enough time to kind of evaluate this thing fully. And so uh, while we are continuing to kind of build on the capabilities that, yes, do require a license, you can just get a couple of user licenses to try it out. Uh, we do have trials, but we've also uh, last summer actually released a an option where an admin can configure a content center, which is a site where models for syntax can be trained and then applied to uh, libraries in your tenant. Um, that uh, site template is was a core piece of syntax when we released it, uh, because that was sort of like the platform for uh, a lot of the new syntax features, specifically these uh, models, these AI apps that you can train. But what we wanted to do was also make those available for evaluation. And so you can go ahead and an admin can configure these content centers, and it's a limited preview. So it allows users to kind of check out some of the features and also um, build a model, but locally test it out. You can't really apply it anywhere without a license. And so that was sort of like that first step. The next step though was to you know, really make these things more broadly available and give people more information to kind of highlight these areas that are really the pillars of syntax, content intelligence, content services, and content discovery. And that also kind of alludes to just a lot of the new capabilities that we're providing. And so I have a couple slides here about what these templates are, but you know, we'll make these available to you guys, uh, I believe, uh, at least through the video here, but better, you can go check these out yourself and even deploy them through the lookbook service. So that's the exciting thing I wanted to demo here today. Um, we did two templates real quickly. For the first one is just this content center site template. And what it what we did was we kind of revamped it. So it includes a lot more information, links to resources like our blog, training materials, sample models that you can actually import and bring in to your library for evaluation to understand how models are constructed and how they work to classify files and extract information from them. And then we gave you sort of more of a solution accelerator, something that's a little bit more aligned towards contract management. And I'm excited about this one because uh, not only does it sort of give a more business focused example uh, and configuration in the site for how you might use syntax in a real world use case like contract management, but we're also working on models that are even easier to deploy specifically around things like contracts. Uh, what we just released earlier this year, in fact, uh, about a month and a half ago, are pre-built models. And the first set of pre-built models that we introduced were uh, invoices and receipts. We have a couple more like contracts that we'll be releasing uh, later this spring and summer, and we'll continue to build out that pre-model portfolio. So what's a pre-model, uh, pre-built model? A pre-built model is one that's pre-trained, that's it. So essentially, instead of you having to go and explain and train the model to understand each entity that you want to extract from a document, what we've done is done some of that heavy lifting for you, where we have evaluated, in this case, let's say thousands of contracts. Well, let's not use contracts because it's not available yet. How about invoices? We've evaluated thousands of invoices, looked at a lot of common entities and invoices like supplier, invoice ID, total, things like this. And train those models. So now what you can do is run those models against your own content. Say, great, you've identified a bunch of the fields that I need, let me configure that model. So not a training experience so much as a configuration. And then you can go ahead and deploy it 
and you're off to the races with very minimal effort. And so this pre-built is sort of like uh, just it's a ramp that we're just starting to build out more on with uh, other partners uh, within the org company and really is I think it's going to amplify what syntax can do for you as we move forward. So what we wanted to do again is make these things available to you guys uh, to get you started uh, through the lookbook service because we just think this is a very powerful and much utilized uh, provisioning tool for your own organization. And so we've added uh, a new SharePoint syntax node and we've added these new templates. And I anticipate that as we build out additional functionality, we'll not only continue to refine these templates, but we'll add additional ones as well uh, based on you know your input and feedback and also what we're developing and what makes sense to kind of compile to kind of get you started. And so what these things look like is the contract management one is fairly rudimentary right now. It's more of a way to sort of think about how syntax can be used, sort of art of the possible. You know, it kind of lays out uh, a lot of the information and pieces for you. What we do is we automatically configure a sample contract library for you. So I'm not going to take you through the whole lookbook provisioning process. Uh, for those of you on the call, you're probably familiar with some of this, but you can just go through if you have global admin or SharePoint admin rights. You can go ahead and uh, uh, select that lookbook template and go ahead and add it to your tenant and it takes anywhere from a couple minutes to 15 minutes and then it will show up in your admin center. Content centers, by the way, are a filterable template. So you'll see here in my environment, I've got a whole bunch of content centers. So yes, you can have more than one. In fact, uh, some of our larger uh, customers are deploying multiple content centers within their tenant just to more organize the models that are deployed for those different parts of their organization. And so that's certainly an information architecture that you might find useful for your organization or business needs as well. So back to the site template, uh, the contracts management one, what we do is when you provision this thing, it already provisions the sample contract library. And you'll see here that not only does it provision the library, it provisions it with a bunch of content and also a model has already been applied here. And you'll see that this model has already processed all of these files and not only identified the content type, uh, essentially classifying the file, but also extracted all this information from these files. And you can go see what these files look like. These are sort of like just a sample contract that illustrates what a document might look like and some of the information that we can extract from it. And you'll see that this is sort of a you know, just an unstructured Word document contract that we can go ahead and train a model to extract information like client address, job ID, uh, client name, service type, et cetera. And you can go see what the model looks like by looking in the model library itself. And in this case, this is a document understanding model. And so these document understanding models uh, uh, effectively allow you to build a model that can be trained to classify these files as well as extract information from them. And so in this example, I've got a bunch of sample files here that I've trained to extract information like client, client address, job ID, et cetera. The same information that you're seeing in this uh, sample contract library, because when the model gets applied, it applies that schema, apply, makes all those uh, uh, it trained extractors columns that can then uh, be populated with the data that's extracted from those files, okay? And so when you look at this model, you'll see that there's this whole process that we've gone through, uh, which is really quite straightforward to go ahead and label the files to help the model understand what information you want to extract. So now you're probably thinking, whoa, whoa, Sean, there's a lot of information. How do I learn more about this sample model that you built? How can I build one on my own with my own content? Well, you can try it out with this contract uh, site template, or we have another site template here, which is also available in the lookbook under the same syntax tab and this is the general content center one. And what this one does is this one's really more of a getting started with syntax. It really is uh, designed to provide a whole, centralize a whole bunch of information around things like how to set up a, a content center, how to get started with syntax. We have links to the learning path, to the blog, all of our documentation, and you can start to learn really about what are the steps to get started with syntax starting with getting that content center created, building your first model. We've got a lot of resources out here on the site, as well as in our documentation. We also have documentation on these site templates themselves. So if you go to uh, 
uh, docs.microsoft.com. I'll pop a link in the window in a second. You'll see that we've got a whole section of uh, documentation on Syntex that walks you through not just the different types of custom models you can build, but also pre-built models, these newly released pre-built models, how those are similar but a little bit different in the fact that they're pre-trained and can be uh, utilized in your organization, as well as other features that we're bringing to the Syntex portfolio, things like content assembly, where you can start to generate content using um, predefined placeholders and information. So think of it as a, a mail merge on steroids. Uh, we're also adding new capabilities like metadata search so that you can start to do clever things like, hey, great, I'm extracting all this information, Sean. Now what do I do with it? Well, you might want to be able to search for it. And so we want to give you more advanced search capabilities that really allow you to leverage that extracted metadata to go and build more rich and interesting uh, and complex searches to uh, find the information that you need, especially if you're starting to collect large volumes of documents and files in a single library. Other features that we're also bringing to the table are things like really leveraging our existing managed metadata services like taxonomy. You know, imagine being able to build an extractor where you don't just extract the information from an uploaded file and write it into the column, but imagine being able to first validate that against uh, a map term set and be able to consistently effectively tag those uploaded documents with your own business vocabulary. So a lot of that information is there. My call to action or encouragement is if you are curious about Syntax or just getting started on your journey with Syntax, I hope you'll find that these templates are incredibly useful to get started, learn more about the product, learn more about where the product is going, and we look forward to your feedback so that we can keep bringing more improvements, not just to these templates, but also additional templates to you to really help you with your content services uh, use cases. A lot of information, a lot of this stuff you can find under uh, aka.ms SharePoint Syntax will be a good place to start. But I've also got some links here to things like uh, our roadmap, some general uh, demos and other resources, as well as we even have a GitHub repo. Uh, some folks are familiar with this. We've uh, been putting some information there like model samples. And we imagine that as we and you, the community, move forward with working with Syntex, there might be opportunities to uh, share and reuse some of these models, especially for common uh, schemas and data elements so that you don't have to always be starting from scratch. The idea is to not only make it easier for, the, you, for you to build and train and configure these models, but also leverage the mind sharing contributions of the community. All right. Um, yes, Adam, uh, Syntex is not a part of E5. It's a separate uh, uh, SKU, uh, separate license. So you can uh, essentially add Syntex to uh, E3. Excellent information, Sean. And yes, we do have a couple more questions in the chat if you'd like to go ahead and respond to those. Um, just in the interest of time, we'll want to make sure that we move on to our next presenter um, so we course. can uh, finish on time. So thank you so much, Sean, for this excellent information. Got lots of thumbs up and hearts as you were going through your section. So know there's interest in this and people want to definitely learn more about this. So appreciate all that you've been able to share today. Absolutely. And thank you. And thank you to uh, everyone on the call for your time and interest. Take care. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks so much. Next, we'll have Patrick to talk to us a little bit about managing state with Viva Connections components. Patrick, the floor is yours. Great, thanks, Brian. Great stuff from Sean there. Love to see all the stuff happening with Syntex. Uh, we're gonna talk real quick, uh, extend our discussion from previous about sharing state and understanding state and managing that inside ACES. And today we're gonna talk a little bit about how we might share that state across multiple controls. So a common scenario, you've got common bits of data you wanna get, uh, but then multiple controls need to use that. So there's more efficient patterns than having each adaptive card extension go get that data. We can actually have ways to share that data between components. The one we're gonna talk about today is using library components, which I think is a neat capability in SharePoint framework and something that works as well in adaptive card extensions or web parts. So once again, I've got two uh, ACE cards here on my screen, and I'll remind you, you don't come to my demos for visual design points. So I've just got a couple of things here that I'll explain shortly, but a string, a length of some items, then an all items dot length there. And you can see both these cards are showing the same information. I'm gonna hit, whoop, that's not F12, that's F12. So if we go over here to the network tab, widen my browser, okay, there we go. We're going to clear this out and we're actually going to go to the application 
And we're going to clear out our local storage and our session storage. Clear this out and go back to the network tab real quick and we hit F5. And so you'll see over here in the network tab as things load up slowly but surely. We hope things load up. Things are still loading up. We'll add our cards back. Making the demo a little bit harder, but you'll see we've only run our queries one time. So we got two cards on the screen, but you can see we're only getting, uh, in this case, this is the one for the, the 30 items, and then we're actually getting uh, the 6,000 items using these various queries here, but they're only getting run one time. And that's kind of the key here is we want to get data once and store it. So we're actually storing this. Uh, in the session storage. So if we look at that, we've got uh, uh, where is session storage? Maybe not. Maybe it's not showing up in session storage. Am I putting? I'm putting it in local storage. Haha. -ha, sorry about that. So in local storage, here's our key. Get lots of items. You can see our stuff there. And then we've got another key here, which is actually just a generated hash value. So we've got that stuff in session storage. That's again part of our conceptual state model. So the state isn't, again, just what's inside the ACE. It's our entire state model of the application. So we're using some caching there in local storage to make things a little bit more efficient. Let's have a look at how all that's actually working. So here's our two uh, adaptive card extensions. And just to real quick, we'll look at the first one. And uh, up at the top, we're importing a, a function called bind data lib. Don't worry about what that does quite yet. From ACE Data Broker, that's the name of our shared library extension. And uh, down here, we're getting that library by binding that data lib. Remember, in SharePoint Framework, you want to base everything off the local context. That tells you where in the world you are rendering, gives you all the information you need, so you don't need to make any assumptions about the environment. And then we're doing a couple of things. We're calling this get string method here. We're calling the get string method here. And then we call the get string method again here. And I just want to point out that all these strings are the same. And that'll be important in just a second. The other thing we're doing is we're loading up some items using a, a method here on the library uh, that we get back. And we're calling this other method on. You've seen methods get called before. It's very exciting. But we get all the items. And then we're seeing items.length there. And we're seeing all items.length there and that's showing you how we're getting the uh, ui updated and what we're doing if we look at the second ace you will see the exact same code so no difference here in the code nothing to highlight other than to show you we're calling the exact same methods from the exact same imported library in both ace components also important to note, these ACEs could be SharePoint Framework web parts. They could be SharePoint Framework application customizers. We could share these uh, shared libraries across uh, all those various solutions. So let's look. This is uh, in the project. There's the ACE project and the library project. Library projects need to be their own project. So I've got my own project here, and I'll drop the link uh, a little bit uh, to, to the documentation on how to get that all set up. But you'll see here in the library project uh, a little bit more of what's going on. So we've got set up, uh, in this case, we're setting up our PMPJS stuff, but this would be true of using any SDKs, the graph SDK, uh, any other SDKs you might be using, even for your uh, independent APIs or your, your home developed NPI APIs, uh, would all work exactly the same way. So you can set this up in the library component once. And then we've got a couple of things. I wanted to highlight again this random string here. So we get that once, and we get that string, and we set it here in what is conceptually a module. This is our ace data broker library.ts, which is a module. So we're getting that string once. And you can see, no matter how many times we called that method, we're always getting the exact same random string back. And what that tells us is something really cool. We're loading this shared library once on the page. So we could actually use this library to help us share some state, coordinate up between our web parts. So we could have web part messaging. We can do a lot of different stuff with that idea. We're setting up some storage. That's what we're going to use to communicate with local storage. And this is just some TypeScript to expand our uh, uh, PNP, uh, JS, uh, SPFI uh, interface there just to add our methods. And then uh, there's our bind data lib. So this is actually just getting that context and doing some setup uh, for the PNPJS. Uh, but then we've got our methods here. So here's get lots of items. And we've got uh, a list here. Uh, we have a function 
called uh, Get All. And uh, in, in PNPJS, so that's going to get all the items from the list. So we're getting like 6,400 and some. That's a lot to do. So we only want to do that uh, once, right, as few times as we can. And we're using our PNPJS storage to actually get or put that in the cache. And we got a cache key uh, there. So nice and easy way to coordinate that. Again, similar patterns for lots of different SDKs uh, out there in the world. And we're also doing some blocking. So we're seeing if we have a running query, we want to stop. Uh, so these aces are going to load randomly, right? You can't ever count on a certain ace to load first or second. So we have to sort of asynchronously block. And we're doing that uh, with promises in this case. So we're we're uh, blocking on a running promise. We're getting something I just in this sample called a resolvable that gives us a promise and the, the function to actually resolve that promise. And then we uh, resolve that down here in the finally. And then we uh, return our results here out of this function. The power of this is because we're using the caching, if we've already blocked and we've made the request, uh, it's going to go through the first time, put it in the cache. And when we unblock here the second time through, it's going to get it from the cache. And that's why we only saw one request go out. Here we've got get items cached. Uh, that's the second method we had just to show sort of a different technique. Uh, we're using the PNPJS caching in here, and we're using a, a thing I did just for this demo called blocking that sort of is going to block that call and mimic the functionality here just inside our PNPJS tool chain. We won't go into do too much detail there. You can check it out in the sample, but just another approach there, and we're using top to only get uh, 20 items, I think, in the, in the actual ACE. We ask for 30, uh, but just a way to do it. And again, using the cache, uh, using the browser cache in Node, this could be uh, you know various tons of different caching technologies there, but conceptually the same idea. Through this uh, library component, we're able to share these methods across the ACEs and only get the data once. And you can see here in this get string, we're just returning that string that we created up here and set once. And uh, again, that shows us this library is only getting used once. So it gives you a lot of power to come back and do stuff there. So you can certainly look at that. And if we come back to our thing here, we've got the stuff in the cache. It might be expired at this point, but just to highlight the advantage here, if we come to our network tab, we did have to make those requests again. They were expired, but if we refresh the page, we'll get our data back and we saw no network requests related to getting those items. So all of that makes our page much more responsive, much faster, uh, helps reduce some cogs on the server, reduces chances of throttling across your service. So it's a really great way uh, if you're deploying stuff within your company, uh, within your, uh, if you're an ISV, this is another great pattern to look at, but it allows you to coordinate uh, across uh, ACEs, web parts, application customizers, across pages. So if you're using local storage or session storage, Storage. Uh, you can actually coordinate this across page loads. So for example, uh, you know, latest news might update every 30 minutes, load that once into local storage, save it, uh, lots of different patterns to use there. But using those libraries, uh, you can definitely you know, have that across all of your different components uh, and, and coordinate your requests and make your requests uh, you know, very intelligently and carefully to ensure you're managing load properly. And so that's a nice quick uh, summary again of how to share state across components, extending our discussion on state. So I'll pass things off to Brian, who I think is going to pass things off to Seb. I'll look at the questions in the chat and try and get those answered. And then I will uh, also paste in right now a link to uh, the SPFX library component tutorial. So definitely check that out. Uh, that's how we were able to build this sample. So thanks, everybody, for having me back and look forward to talking to you soon. Thank you so much, Patrick. I'm surprised you're not out of breath because it sounded like you just had a long stream of awesome content there in demos. So uh, thank you so much for sharing all this great stuff. And yes, we will do the relay handoff, uh, Patrick to myself, myself to Seb. Seb, you have the floor. I do have the floor. And, and, and thanks, Brian. That will be today, sadly, this will be our last getting started with the Microsoft Graph Toolkit segment of the Microsoft 365 platform call. It's been 15 amazing weeks, um, and I wanted to end up with one last bit that I think is extremely cool. Today's session is about our MGT samples repository that we are introducing today. You've seen sample galleries on the team side of things, on the SharePoint framework side of things. But today, 
we are introducing it for the Microsoft Graph Toolkit. And uh, one of the call to actions we want is if you have any samples you'd like to contribute, like some of the community members already did, I'm going to show you that, we'll be more than happy to have you join this community, get the shout out every couple of weeks on the different community calls, and also share what you've learned, share your experience, because sharing is caring. So let me go on and, and slide through a little bit. So what is the Graph Toolkit? We've learned a lot about the toolkit, but I don't want to remind you what exactly is a toolkit. A toolkit is a collection of reusable framework agnostic components and auth providers that allow you to access and work with the Microsoft Graph. Our components are fully functional. They're entirely customizable, and we're going to see that later. And they work with any web framework and on all modern browsers. So if you're looking at capabilities that integrate with Microsoft Graph, like person cards, person components, people, people picker, the Graph Toolkit is your best friend. But why would you use a toolkit? First, it definitely cuts on development time because you can easily add any UI components to your app, any type of web apps, and it automatically gets access to Microsoft Graph. It can basically abstract you all that complexity. So I'm a very lazy developer. I love to, to cut on development time by basically sitting on top of others. And that's exactly what we can do here. It's beautiful, but it's also very flexible. If you love uh, M365, you're going to get the look out of the box. But if you like to customize it, you're going to be able to come in and change all nubs, all settings to make sure that the components look like you want. And also, it works everywhere based on web standards. And it works on any web frameworks. So think about if you want to make your apps available in Teams, it's going to work over there. If you want to make your apps available in the SharePoint framework, it's going to work over there. If you want to make your app work in Electron or as a SPA, it's going to also work over there. And today, I think what I want to emphasize is that the Microsoft Graph Toolkit is absolutely in love with the PMP community. We've been sharing a lot of these how-tos in the last couple of weeks, but today what I'd like is invite you on a journey that brings you back to MGT and also gives you the opportunity to start sharing your own symbol. So today what we're gonna do, we are gonna demo our Microsoft Graph Toolkit sample repository with a couple of the cool goodies that we offer. It's gonna be a little bit of a less technical session today, um, less code, but so much fun. So let me go on and start sharing my window. So here you see I am on github.com slash pnp slash mgt dash samples. This is where all of our samples are starting from. This is a very classic repo that we build that uses the same capabilities that the SharePoint framework, web parts repo uses, the teams are, do, do, uh, are using, that the Power Platform folks are also using. So you're gonna be very familiar with this repository right there. In there, if you want to explore, what I invite you is to go on and look at the samples folder. In the samples folder, you will, want, you will find a series of different samples that you can see that community members have added in the past. Right now we have four samples and I'd love to get within the next couple of weeks, at least 15 to 20 samples that we can share with the community and make sure that you get highlighted by being the author or contributor to these different samples. I also strongly invite you to look at the Sharing is Caring initiative if you want to build your first sample and want to understand how and how it works with Git and VS Code, I invite you to go over there. I think that's going to be a great session for you. Now, um, let's look at one of these samples. Now we're going into GitHub. We're going to show you different ways later on how this can work. So let's start with, for example, the MGT get emails. Well, this is a great way to start. Here you're gonna have a summary. We're gonna always define and, and explain what this sample does with a nice uh, simple screenshot of what this functionality is. You're gonna see what's the compatibility, what's the version of MGD that was tested with this uh, feature, with this sample. 
how it applies, what it applies to, who has been creating the the uh, the solution, when that was done, a couple of features, and I think a really, really, really cool capability, which is something that we added on our playground. MGT has a playground where you can play around MGT live in your browser. But here, what we're doing is we're connecting the dots between our repo, between our samples repo, and the MGT playground. So what you can do here, let me just open that in a new tab. Now you're going to open that up here. It's going to load, take a couple of seconds. And now, I don't know if you've seen it, but we've got uh, this sample right here. Interesting that it actually loads the let me a second. I'm just going to reload this. Might, might actually be a, a small bug we have. Well, we look like we have a bug, but let's pretend that this was the right sample that we're using here. It really brings a sample in here. So you can not only see it in a screenshot, but you can start playing with it. You can play around. You can really, really make it super, super, super simple for everybody to use. So um, that's a great thing that we have. Now, from here, you can e even interact with it. For example, go to the launch team, do the design stuff, and, and really see how this plays out over here. It looks like we're having some interesting, I guess it's a launch time issue, right? We're gonna come back to that a little bit later on. So a couple of things that I wanted to mention also is we also already got some really, really cool contributions from the community. So for example, this MGT get multiple person was actually authored by our Microsoft list formatting and everything Microsoft 365 related uh, superhero, Andre did this really, really cool sample that kind of highlights you how you can leverage hover effects in MGT to bring more people inside a shorter or a smaller area into your screen. So how do you do that? Well, you have all the code. If you want to go to the source here, you're going to be able to see all the CSS, all the HTML right from here. But you will also be able, and let's see if we have a second demo effect or not. I should have tested that before. Here you should, oh, there you go. Now it works flawlessly, my, my mistake earlier. Here you see exactly what Andre had in mind when he was building his sample. He was using this, and I can actually go here and have the full uh, capabilities of all these really cool features that Andre built. So we would love if you could come to that repo and start sharing what you already built with the Microsoft Graph Toolkit, but also what you're envisioning and maybe even request new templates to be created. We have all of that. You can log in an issue over there, you can start discussion, you, create que you can uh, create new questions. All of that is already pre-configured for you. Now let's go see what our other samples that we already have, one of them being a team's channel messages, which seems to be what we saw a little bit earlier, but um, replicating some of the team's capabilities. So let's go and see how this was done. And I'm gonna let you uh, go into the very like nitty gritty details. I won't go into super deep in there, but I wanna show how powerful this can be when as a community, we come all together and we really make sure that we have all that thing played out. Just to make it on purpose, it looks like we're having some issues today. Oh, there we go. Now it's loaded. I think it was a GitHub issue. I'm going to put that on GitHub today. Um, so if I go to design, for example, here, I'm going to have a load. And now I have the full capabilities of Teams here with the replies and all of that when I'm using just a couple of line of HTML with some of the components that we already mentioned in the previous call. So you're more than welcome to go on and start exploring the repo. But if you're more like me, maybe you wanna search for stuff. We're happy today to announce that we are also making available all of these samples inside the sample solution gallery. So for example, I can go here and I can actually search for the Microsoft Graph Toolkit. And when I hit search in here, you will be able to see all the different solutions that are utilizing the Microsoft Graph Toolkit and all their authors. So you're going to be able to go here, go and see. I'm very interested into that demo. I click on this one. I'm going to have the full page for that specific demo. 
And then afterwards from there, I will be able to go and see the repository directly inside GitHub, or I will be able to download the code right from here. And also I'm gonna be able to see all the different components that have been used. So I'm using MGT get, MGT person, and the MGT teams channel picker. So when you're looking at this option, you're gonna really know what is being customized and how this solution was built. Finally, you can go and click on view on GitHub where you will be able to find again, the link to bring you back to the playground like this, where you will be able to experience it live for you right from here. So that's what I wanted to showcase today for the Microsoft Graph Toolkit. Let me go on, stop sharing and reload my deck in just one second, just so we can finish with a couple of links. So a couple of resources, the repo for MGT in general, um, aka.ms slash MGT, our documentation, aka.ms slash MGT slash docs, our issues, the samples that we just talked about, aka.ms slash MGT slash samples. If you want to play within our playground or you want to learn more about MGT, feel free to visit all of these links. And it was a fun series. Let's see if we do a season two in a couple of weeks when I'm back at work. I thought it would, it would be a great moment to wear my giraffe suit today to close that series. So it was great to go through all of these MGT content with all of you. If you have any comments, any feedback, feel free to go to our repo, create an issue, or just drop them in the chat right here. It was great to see that. Brian, back to you. Thank you so much, Seb. We really appreciate the, was it 15 or 16 uh, 15, weeks worth of 15. 15. That <laughs> is an amazing accomplishment. We appreciate all of the uh, time and planning and effort that you've done to putting this in. And again, yes, we've got lots of requests already for uh, <laughs> season two. Uh, do not worry, community. We've already talked with the Graph DevX team about some other uh, series for potential futures. So again, thank you, Seb, for back. all of this. I'm sorry yeah. about that. <laughs> the, 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 <laughs> No worries. All right, thanks so much, Deb, and have a good rest of your day. We'll wrap things up here with just our last few slides on this. This is our Microsoft 365 uh, platform developer community call. We do have other additional community calls that are available as well for adaptive cards, for identity, offset ins, power apps, and more. Please take a look at aka.ms slash m365pmp, where you can find the links and invites to all of those different series. As always, recordings of these calls will be made available 24 hours uh, on the Microsoft 365 community, uh, the PMP YouTube channel. You can find that again at aka.ms slash m365pmp slash videos. Please feel free to subscribe today so you get the latest announcements as videos are published out to there. You can follow along with us on Twitter at Microsoft365Dev as well as at m365pmp. Our next call will be April 5th next week at our usual time, 8 a.m. Pacific time. Please do take a look at the um, invites for this, add this to your calendar, invite your friends, invite your coworkers. We'd love to have the community growing and have more folks joining in. With that, appreciate everyone joining in today. Thank you and have a wonderful rest of your day. Mm -hmm.